Okay, I want to thank the engineers uh, who we interrupted in their development process to come out and try to show their products in action. And uh, now there's only one thing, um, well, actually two things left to do. Uh, this is one. Uh, but to finish our day, uh, we'd like to uh, bring up someone who needs no introduction, one of the co-founders of the company and the father of LabVIEW, to share some of his, his thoughts about time and programming. Please welcome Jeff Kodosky. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> um, physicists still debate the meaning of time, but I'm not going to attempt to be that profound this morning. I'm just going to talk about the role of time in programming languages. In the beginning, computers were just used for computation and data processing. There was no notion of time in early high-level languages like Fortran and Lisp. The primary concern of programming was specifying the details of the computation and ensuring it proceeded correctly. The sequence of computational steps was the meaning of the program. How long it took was simply a quality of the machine that it ran on. The first notion of time in a programming language appears in HP BASIC with the wait statement. HP used the BASIC language on their programmable calculators connected to instruments using the GPIB so that measurements could be automated. Writing programs to control instruments presented some additional challenges over and above the normal programming activity, namely coordinating the execution of the program with the behavior of the instrument. Instruments take time to make a measurement or to change function or range and the program had to regulate its progress in order to stay in sync with what the instrument was doing. The simplest way to do this was to introduce a wait statement that would delay execution of the program for a specified amount of time. The program would observe the worst case time that it took the, an, an instrument to do something and then following the command to the instrument it'd insert a wait statement for at least that long. This is relatively simple and effective although it can waste a lot of time. The wait milliseconds primitive in LabVIEW is similar to the wait statement in BASIC, and surprisingly, this is the state of the art in modern languages like C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Python, and so on. Time becomes much more uh, important issue when feedback control is done with a computer. A program that not only measures some inputs, but also provides outputs to control an experiment or machine must be more precise in how it deals with time. In these real-time programs, Correctness is as much about time as it is about computation. The correct computational results must be delivered to the outputs at precisely the right time or the system will fail. The ubiquity of cyber-physical systems today is driving the concern about time in programming languages. Not only our convenience, but increasingly our health and safety depend on cyber-physical systems. Yet in many cases, the embedded programs have no more sophisticated representation of time than a wait statement. The timing for a control application is qualitatively different than for a measurement application. The physics of the machine controlled by the program demands that measurements and actuator outputs occur at precisely timed intervals. The intervals are, if the intervals are too long or irregular, the reliability and stability of the machine will be compromised. A simple wait statement will drift in time by the execution time of the code, and the execution time of the code may vary, causing timing jitter. Uh, by the way, a good example of drift can be seen with some of the um, escalators here. I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes the handrail runs a little bit faster than the steps. That slow drift really isn't the, the, the main problem. The main problem is the discontinuity when you have to lift your hand and move it back closer. In LabVIEW, a loop with the metronome primitive will not drift because the wake-up time is referenced to the previous wake-up time, not to the time the call was made. It's possible to achieve the same behavior using other languages like C and C++, but it isn't as simple and convenient as in LabVIEW. Many cyber-physical systems today are written in C and use system calls to wait. For simple systems, this is fine, especially because inexpensive microprocessors have gotten so fast. But when the application starts pushing the performance limits of the processor, the complexity goes way up. Computations that take longer than the period of the main loop must be broken up and done piecemeal. 
Communications that are asynchronous with respect to the main loop must be scheduled and coordinated so they don't interfere. Lots of testing and a bit of good luck accounts for most of these systems working well most of the time. The compiler is unable to help with the timing analysis because time is not an element of the language. It's a parameter to a system call. And the parameter is a minimum time to wait when what is really needed is a way to specify a deadline, a concept which doesn't even exist in conventional programming languages. In LabVIEW, on the other hand, there's a timed loop as a first class element of the language. It has a great deal of flexibility in specifying timing properties and sensing timing behavior. And because it's a structure, it's also capable of specifying a timing constraint, namely that the code inside must complete within the specified period. In the common case of a constant period, the compiler could statically analyze the code generated for the body of the loop and determine whether it'll meet the timing constraint even before it's deployed on the tar target machine. LabVIEW isn't able to do this kind of analysis yet, and it's more complicated than I made it sound for several reasons, which I'll describe in a moment. But this is something that we're working on, particularly for LabVIEW FPGA, where the analysis can be much tighter. So what makes programming real time so hard? Fred Books, in his paper, No Civil Bullet, made a distinction between essential and inherent complexity and accidental or artificial complexity of a program. The inherent complexity is due to the difficulty of the computation itself while the artificial complexity is due to the programming language and the tools being used. For instance, uh, preparing a manuscript used to have much more artificial complexity back when cut and paste meant actually using scissors and paste. I'd like to suggest there's another form of artificial complexity that Dr. Brooks didn't focus on, and that's system architecture. In many applications in the past, it was sufficient to write a program from the von Neumann perspective as sequential code running against a large uniform memory space. That model is not very useful for real-time programs running on today's machines with their multiple cores, shared multi-level caches, pipelines, branch predictions, speculative ex execution, and so on. The performance of a real-time program can vary by an order of magnitude depending on how it's mapped to the machine. The architectural elements of the machine add significantly to the artificial co complexity of the application. The bane of real-time design on today's processors is cache interference. A low-priority task can cause a cache spill for a high-priority task and destroy its real-time performance. This is a non-local interference that the high-priority task can neither predict nor prevent. It's incumbent upon the system designer to know all the details about all the tasks run being run and verify that in the worst case scenario, interference will not affect the real-time behavior of the most important tasks. This is impossible to do in general. As a result, many real-time programs are brittle, exhibiting extreme sensitivity and unpredictable outcome from small changes to the code. Sensors and actuators are the interface to the physical world and the timing of their I.O. represents the inherent complexity of the application. Ideally, nothing else should have to be specified about timing. But in practice, a lot more scheduling must be specified because resources such as memory and cache and cores and buses are all shared. That extra scheduling represents artificial complexity and it often dominates application development. There's a class of languages called synchronous languages of which SRL is probably the most well known. Synchronous languages focus on reacting to discrete real-time events. They've been used in safety-critical systems such as aircraft landing gear controllers and nuclear reactor shutdown sequences. Their utility stems from the underlying synchronous hypothesis they make, namely that at each clock tick, the signals of the system are updated, the update is assumed to happen instantaneously, and nothing changes between the ticks. This assumption allows the designer to separate concerns about correctness of logical sequencing from the concerns about timing feasibility. 